This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome. You're listening to Little Wonders, a collection of flash fiction and poetry centered around a theme or genre. This episode, we bring you a trio of fantasy offerings, one flash story, and two poems about things that aren't quite what they appear to be. Our first story is Golly by Laura DeHaan. Laura is a healthcare practitioner in her hometown of Toronto, Ontario, in Canada. She pays her bills by helping people relax and feel better. But when she writes, she likes making people feel just a little awful. She has a couple stories coming out in autumn. One in Postscripts to Darkness 4 about a new kind of danger posed by an invasive species, and one in Andromeda Spaceways In Flight magazine involving a zombie cowboy and a talking snake. Something for everyone. You can find her on Twitter at Write in Rooster and follow the bizarre travelogues of the much put upon tourist Topher Topher. Golly is narrated for you by Melissa Bouguet. Melissa is the proud mom of an eight year old boy and a five year old girl. She's a special educator in her 14th year of teaching. Melissa has taught all grade levels from preschool to grade five in both general and special education. This year, however, she's taking a leap in her teaching as she enters the high school levels as a conceptual physics teacher. Hmm. She co writes and co produces an original children's story podcast with her husband Chris called Night Light Stories. And she also writes a personal blog called According to Mags about her children's silly antics that keep her and her readers entertained. Melissa enjoys presenting with her husband at different state conferences on the subjects of audio stories and podcasting. We'll have links for you of these and all the other websites we mention in our show notes. Ready for some stories? Good, because surprising things come in small packages. Golly by Laura DeHaan A girl and a boy stood at opposite ends of a clearing in the woods. As the girl's family lived nearby, and she felt it was there for her clearing, she spoke first. What's your name? He was a handful of years older than her, with knees and elbows and eyebrows he'd eventually grow into. Raff, he said, what's yours? Goldilocks, she said, and looked it. That's a dumb name, he announced without deliberation. I can't take you serious with a name like that. Indignation made her sputter. He went on carelessly. Want to play? Goldilocks' family was one that had fled the Eastwise Kingdom after the bad enchantment had settled there, and she hadn't met any other children since. All right, she allowed, but I'm going to call you Ruffian. I'm going to call you Golly, he said, and Goldilocks needed no other enticement to follow his cry of, Catch me if you can! They stopped by a stream and looked for frogs and fish and enchanted princesses, and climbed trees and dared each other to throw rocks at a hornet nest, and ran hollering when they were chased by the angry hive. Raff led them further and further afield with a wave of his hand claiming dominance over the woods. Only don't go that way, he said, and to Goldilocks it seemed his nonchalant gesture encompassed a good deal of that way. There's bears in those parts. Bears are the worst. What do they look like? said Goldilocks, who had never seen a bear. Oh, they're big. Bigger than that tree, I guess. He said with another lazy gesture toward a mature pine. They've got big blunt faces and big blunt teeth, and they sneak up on you when you're wide awake and pouts. He leapt on her back, and they fell in a tangle. Get off, dope! She kicked and pounded with her fists, and he rolled off, laughing. Anyway, they do, he said. One more game, she said. I need to get home soon. We'll need a flag, he said. Hand me your apron. It was stained from various trips to collect berries. Goldilocks undid the knot and passed it to Raff. 
Right, he said. Let's play Capture the Fleeing Flag. Raph, she yelled. Ruffian, come back here. She pursued, quickly losing sight, but following his laughter. You wait till I tell my brother. He'll skin you. You don't have a brother, Raph yelled distantly. You told me so yourself. Raph! She was lost and confused. His voice echoed strangely when she heard it at all. Raph, tell me how to get home! It was getting dark, and Goldilocks cast about anxiously for a familiar path while trying to remember in which direction the bears lay. East? Or? Or? No, she muttered, turning in place. There were notches in a tree near her, three atop each other. Someone must have done that, she said to herself, to mark their path and keep from losing their way. After a quick search, she found another tree nearby with the same three notches. Whether they were going to or from, she couldn't say, but she followed them eagerly and soon came upon a little cottage. Hello? she called. Please, I'm lost. Could you? Could you? And she trailed off, not quite knowing what could be done. There was no answer. Goldilocks pushed on the door and found it opened in two sections, top and bottom. Perhaps the lower one is for the children to run through, she said, though it seemed doubtful as she still had to stoop down to get inside. It was one room with only some supporting beams and a partition to separate the space at all. A fireplace sat in one wall, ashes and embers in its pit. The floor was covered with animal skins, great big ones with coarse, shaggy hair. A few long bones lay scattered in a corner, looking not upon. They must have dogs, she said, and laughed suddenly. Of course, the lower door was for the dog to come through, and there was a distinctly doggy smell about the place. More importantly, there was a bowl of raspberries on the table. It's been so long since lunch, and perhaps if I don't eat very many... The sound of her own voice was comforting in the quiet room. Soon her eyelids started drooping. I do hope whoever lives here gets here soon, she said. Otherwise they'll find me asleep on the floor. Her eyes went to the partition. Maybe there's a bed behind there. It can't be worse to find me asleep in bed like a sensible person rather than stretched out on the rug. She looked behind the partition at the other end of the room. There was one large bed tucked into the corner with more furs around its base. The bed was neatly made. It would have been hard to not make it neat as there were no pillows or blankets on it, only a thin sheet. Goldilocks took off her shoes and snuggled under it. It was not warm at all. I wonder if they have any children, Goldilocks mumbled. I hope not. They'd freeze, but perhaps they sleep all piled together. The sound of a door being shut woke her up. Goldilocks held her breath, fearful of discovery. But how silly! She scolded herself a moment later. They must be kind people to sleep together and own dogs. It'd be worse to stay in bed. I'll go present myself. So saying was so doing, and she slipped out from under the sheet and peeked around the partition. Two people were already looking in her direction, a man and a woman. They were middle-aged and lean and watched her with neither frowns nor smiles. "'Excuse me,' Goldilocks said politely. "'I'm sorry to intrude, but I lost my way, and I heard there were bears in the woods.' The couple's faces relaxed into smiles. "'Right you are,' the man said. "'Terrible things, those bears. Are you hungry? There's a bowl of raspberries on the table, which I see you've already found,' he added, pointing at his lips." Goldilocks' hand flew up to her mouth, and she felt stickiness there. Oh, she said, but the couple only laughed. The woman joined her at the table while the man put a log in the fireplace and stirred the embers to flames. It's perfectly fine that you're here, the woman said, with plenty of space in the bed. 
It's very big for the two of you, Goldilocks said. Do you have any children? We've had our share, the man said, standing up from the fire. They grow up so fast. Sometimes one of them drops by. And dogs, said Goldilocks. Have you a lot of dogs? Just one at the moment, the man chuckled. We let him tire himself out before he comes in at night. It is getting rather late, said the woman. Perhaps we'd better turn in. You must be tired after today. Goldilocks followed the woman behind the partition while the man went outside to call for the dog. They slipped into bed, although the woman stayed on top of the sheet. Do you see many bears? said Goldilocks. Oh, no, said the woman. They know not to come around here. Your dogs must be very fierce to protect you against bears, Goldilocks yawned. The woman stroked her hair. Comforted, Goldilocks muzzled her nose into the woman's thigh. Very fierce, said the woman. Bears, nasty creatures, mean things. Why, a bear would gobble you up feet first while you were looking. The door opened and closed again. With the partition between them, Goldilocks didn't see the gangly young wolf trotting cheerfully beside the man, a berry stained apron in its sharp toothed mouth. A bear would make all sorts of fuss and noise. The smell of dog grew stronger as the man dropped to all fours, shook himself, and was replaced by another, larger wolf in man's clothing. Wolves now. Crooned the woman, and Goldilocks breathing deepened, and her eyes twitched behind their lids. Wolves will wait until you sleep. Not what you expected, was it? Retellings of classic fairy tales are very popular right now. It's given authors a chance to expand on the tried and true plots we'd recognize from Disney films with new twists. For example, my all time favorite fantasy author, Mercedes Lackey, has a series like this as well. They're called the Elemental Masters, and in them, magicians have the ability to manipulate one of the four classic Western elements earth, air, water, and fire. One of her books tells the story of a San Francisco fire master turned into a hideous monster who battles with an earth mage, resulting in the famous 1907 earthquake and fire. Doesn't sound much like the Beauty and the Beast you know, does it? Speaking of elements, our next entry is the poem An Alchemist's Limit by Brian Griggs. You may remember Brian and his alchemist from episode 22, Rust. This poem was written as a result of your positive feedback to that story. Brian says he loves how the character is trying to simultaneously make sense of electron shells and organized crime. Brian has been an educator for 12 years and has been encouraged to write fiction and poetry by his students and co workers. He hopes his stories inspire curiosity and wonder in students of all ages. You can learn more about the Alchemist's Guild at his website, brianriggs.com. He's also avid on Twitter via at Brian underscore Griggs. He'd love to hear your thoughts on the poem. Your narrator is our very own, very hardworking, and very talented Graham Dunlop. I asked Graham if he wanted me to put anything new in his bio, and he said no, so I'll just tell you about one of his other narrations he's been working on lately. He appeared in episode 301 of Starship Sofa, reading Tim Mon's limited edition. We'll include that link for you in the show notes. An Alchemist's Limit by Brian Griggs A flick and a flip, then a proton gloms on with the heat and the flash of a miniature star. Subatomic junk, pushed nickel down the table till it shifts and it shines as palladium smile. But the guild, ah, the guild takes a chunk of the loot for the lessons, for protection, for the alchemist's craft. I pause and I think about the Yakuza's cash. How long could I run till I'm caught by my guild? Split the O from the H to make flammable blood. I slump and I sigh. 
you don't double-cross gods. A flick and a flip, then a proton gloms on with the heat and the flash of a miniature star. Subatomic junk, push nickel down the table till it shifts and it shines as palladium smile. But the guild, yeah, the guild, takes a chunk of the loot for the lessons for protection of the alchemist's craft. I pause and I think about the Yakuza's cash. How long can I run till I'm caught by my guild? Split the O from the H to make flammable blood. I slump and I sigh. You don't double-cross gods. A flick and a flip, then a proton gloms on with the heat and the flash of a miniature star. Subatomic junk, push nickel down the table till it shifts and it shines as palladium's smile. But the guild, oh the guild, takes a chunk of the loot for the lessons for protection of the alchemist's craft. I pause, and I think about the Yakuza's cash. How long could I run till I'm caught by my guild? Split the O from the H to make flammable blood. I slump and I sigh. You don't double-cross gods. This episode marks the second time Cast of Wonders has aired poetry. Our first was the very excellent Eggs Under Moon from episode 29, where three different narrators brought you their interpretation of a single poem. This time, we decided to try something a little different. I asked the narrators of the poems to read the poem for you three different times in different interpretive styles. I agree with Barry that understanding and appreciating a poem improves with repetition, and I'm curious to hear what you think about our new approach. Let us know on the forum. Finally this episode, Cast of Wonders is pleased to present Empires of the Red Dawn by Jack Murphy. Jack just turned 18, and this piece is his first professional sale. Congratulations, Jack! We hope to see more submissions from him and other young adult creatives in the future. Jack says he's not very good at biographies, so instead he gave us three individual words. Transient, Pantheon, and Objuration. Ooh, good choices. I love it when I have to look up a new word. Your narrator for Empires is my good friend Adam Black. Adam is a recovering neurosciences student, although he's working hard to relapse again. He enjoys reading, bicycling, and shouting into microphones, the last of which he sometimes records. He doesn't have a public web presence yet, which makes him sad, so that'll probably change soon. Empires of the Red Dawn by Jack Murphy He is ancient and wise, aware of far distant regions and the treasures there. The breeze carries his word in chariots of golden light, pulled along by glass horses towards children of the crown, who hunt across bright deserts with intelligent precision. Can we unwind this gray mystery? Let us build crystal palaces in honor of his eternal hunt. He is ancient and wise, aware of far distant regions and the treasures there. The breeze carries his word in chariots of golden light, pulled along by glass horses towards children of the crown who hunt across bright deserts with intelligent precision. Can we unwind this gray mystery? Let us build crystal palaces in honor of his eternal hunt. He is ancient and wise, aware of far distant regions and the treasures there. 
The breeze carries his word in chariots of golden light, pulled along by glass horses towards children of the crown who hunt across bright deserts with intelligent precision. Can we unwind this gray mystery? Let us build crystal palaces in honor of his eternal hunt. It's hard to believe that summer is almost over. How's your summer been going? Did you finish your reading piles and all those little projects you meant to get to? I just finished all three Hunger Game novels in a 36-hour stint. I couldn't stop reading them. And after I saw City of Bones, I'm considering picking up the rest of the Mortal Instruments series, as well as the other Percy Jackson books, quick before it's back to textbooks for me. Last week, we announced our very exciting Camp Myth project beginning September 25th. I can't wait! The Kickstarter for Book 2 will be ending shortly, so make sure to take a look before those merit badge pins slip through your grasp. And speaking of summer projects, I've been giving the Cast of Wonders website some shiny new features in addition to brushing off some old digital cobwebs. You can now search our stories by genre and key story themes like Mars and Cats and Books. You can also search by an author or a narrator's name. Give it a try and let us know if there are other features you'd like to see. I'm watching friends on my Twitter feed begin their travels to Dragon Con this weekend in Atlanta, Georgia, where the Parsec Awards will be announced on Saturday night. We have our fingers crossed for Rick Kennett and wish all the finalists in every category the best of luck. May the odds be always in their favor. If you have something to share about this or any of our episodes, visit our forum or share it with your friends and family. And please consider donating to Cast of Wonders to help us keep bringing you the best young adult audio fiction week after week. Cast of Wonders is a production of Wolfsbane Publishing and is brought to you by our Podcasters 3, Graham Dunlop, your host and audio producer, Barry J. Northern, our publisher and artist, and I remain as always your humble editor, Marguerite Kenner. Our episodes are released under a Creative Commons, Attribution, Non-Commercial, No Derivatives license. Share it, but don't change it. The Little Wonders theme, Neverses, is by Alexi Nov and provided by MusicAlley.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>